everyone. Welcome back to the podcast on the way uh, podcast for the Center of Bible Study. Uh, my name is Max Botner, and I am the director of the center. I'm really excited for our episode today. We've got Dr. Matthew Lynch on. He is a professor of Old Testament at Regent College in Vancouver, Canada, a really great uh, school. Matt has written a lot, uh, a, a lot of important um, academic monographs on the Old Testament, including a, an academic monograph on violence in the Old Testament. So we wanted to have him on today to actually discuss his new book, um, Flood and Fury, Old Testament Violence and the Shalom of God, which is a more popular treatment of violence in the Old Testament, focused in particular on the flood and uh, the conquest narratives. If you're anything like me, uh, this is probably one of the questions that you've wrestled with the most when it comes to how to reconcile uh, issues in scripture with what we know uh, and confess about the character of God. So like divine violence in scripture, this has been something that I've wrestled with a lot in my faith and uh, continue to wrestle with. I, I wanted to have Matt on because he's a great scholar and he's written this fantastic book, which in my opinion is one of the, if not the uh, most helpful treatments uh, on this issue that I've read. He just does a great job of mixing together pastoral concern, a theological insight, biblical studies, acumen. Uh, he, he mixes it all together so well, and um, he's, he's created this really helpful resource. So I'd encourage you to consider uh, buying a copy, maybe even buying some for friends and family as well, and considering uh, consider working through uh, this question together in some, in some detail. I agree with Matt that I think it's an issue that we all should be wrestling with, and that maybe it's in the wrestling, in fact, that God will form us uh, more into the image of his son, Jesus. So very excited to uh, to have Matt on the show. You've been watching us for any time now and you haven't yet, please do be sure to uh, subscribe to this channel that will uh, alert you to all of the releases of our upcoming episodes. We release one episode each Monday. Uh, we also do YouTube short, short content, and we'll continuously be adding to our list of additional content including clips from episodes, but also other YouTube specific videos that will be added to the channel. So we're just getting started here at the Center for Bible Study. And by subscribing, you're ensuring that you'll be alerted to a lot of great uh, Bible content that will be coming out in the future. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into our episode with Dr. Lynch. A Torah related issue that needs to be considered. Wow. So you're you're walking out of Deuteronomy where it says, you know, show them no mercy, wipe them all out, kill them all. Then you encounter this Canaanite woman who's a prostitute and all your alarms are going off. But then it turns out she makes this extraordinary Yahweh confession. Mm. So I think meditating on Torah day and night is a real world dynamic. Thanks so much, Matt, for being here. Yeah, great to be here, Max. I'm excited to discuss the book. Awesome, awesome. Well, to begin, could you just give us uh, just a little bit of an intro to who you are, uh, maybe a little bit about your faith journey and how you came to become a, a Bible scholar? What, what was that like? Yeah, I grew up in a Christian home and um, where the Bible was, was important. We read it as a family. It was, you know taught in church regularly, uh, valued and, and taught by my parents as well. So my mom, um, taught Bible in high school and my dad taught Sunday school at church and he was ordained and, uh, preached, preached it. Uh, my grandfather was a preacher. So I, I grew up in a pretty scripture immersive environment and I'm really grateful for that. Um, mm -hmm. it's not something i I feel like I've had to spend my adult life reacting against, mm -hmm. um, Sure, there are certain things that I see differently now, and in, in terms of just the the um, theological perspective that I grew up with, not necessarily from my parents per se, but just culturally. Sure. Um, so I've had to do a lot of growing and learning along the way, but but um, I grew up in this scripture immersive context, and I think because of that, and because it was um, a good experience overall, um, the violence in the Bible was not something that that really kind of struck me as something needing resolution. Mm -hmm. um, sure, sure. So when it's your culture that you are immersed in, then uh, you don't always question it. Mm. Um, so um, when I was an undergrad, 
I went to Israel for a semester. And at that point, I wasn't planning to pursue biblical studies, um, but I went to Jerusalem University College and spent a semester there. And while I was there, I really fell in love with academic study of the Bible. I took an intertestamental literature class and you know, studying the land and context of the Bible, uh, but also the, the history and politics in modern Middle East, um, medieval Judaism. It kind of uh, sort of blew my mind and expanded my perspective. And I think that in in conjunction with, uh, you know, encountering realities on the ground of, of um, you know, Israel-Palestine dynamics, uh, so just sort of also... Um, opened my eyes to uh, ju issues of justice. Mm. Um, so at that same moment, I was getting into biblical studies. I was also maybe awakening to dynamics of social injustice. So I, th I think that that combination sort of primed the pump. Then when I went to grad school, um, I think I mentioned the book, the first day of grad school was 9-11, 2001. Yeah. Um, and, and so that sort of the, the uh, aftermath of the attack on the twin towers and mm. then the 2003 Iraq invasion were playing in the background while I was studying the Bible and were part of the natural conversation between those of us in grad school as we were studying books like Joshua. Yeah. So it's hard, it's hard to read and study Joshua deeply while the Iraq invasion is happening and not, not think about some resonance between the two. Sure. Um, and, Especially and with so, language, language of axis of evil and, you know, all yeah. this, locating the evil in the, in the, in this other yeah, yeah. people group. And yeah, exactly. Which I think Joshua actually has a lot to say about, mm. uh, about mm. where you locate evil, mm. but, but yeah, that was, you know, so because of that environment, that, that cultural conversation that was happening, um, I think I started thinking about the, the text differently or asking new questions around violence and, and uh, thinking through how how am I supposed to wrestle through this as, as a Christian? Yeah. Um. What are what, what is my perspective on just war or pacifism? Hmm. And 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 also having professors who were pacifists and um uh, or having that conversation about hmm. just war in that context. So so that was the sort of soup out of which <laughs> my yeah. um like my emergence into biblical studies and these questions around violence emerged. Yeah. And and then when I started teaching, of course, it came up with students all the time. And and I remember one student who who said like she she run, she feels like she runs to Jesus from the God of the Old Testament. Yeah. And that's a common. I mean, we hear that yeah. so often. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It really crystallized for me, like that dynamic of like the, the and that that just that little statement touches on so many issues in biblical studies, as you know, like the relationship between the Testaments, mm -hmm. um, sort of the history of uh, Marcionism, which is this uh, idea that the Old Testament should be cut off. Um, yeah. That, that's, that persists in the church in varying forms, like, you know, so Marcionist, Marcionism light and, and, and sure. so on. Sure. Um, and, and also the, the issue of violence that impinges on that divine wrath, God's character, is God's character consistent? What's the relationship between the portrait of the of God in the Bible mm -hmm. and the God I believe in? Like, should right. those be identical, or um, is there a gap between the two that I need to live with? Yeah. Um, so, those are the the sorts of questions that came out of my entrance into biblical studies and have persisted. So not small questions, to put it mildly. No. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Well, I love how you highlight that because I think so much of our our biblical scholarship is autobiography in some ways. Yeah. And I think it's fun for others who maybe aren't in the guild, so to speak, to hear us mm -hmm. to speak frankly about that because it, it shows that, you know, all of us who are doing biblical scholarship, we're just human beings uh, <laughs> trying yeah. to make sense of the world like everybody else. And we just yeah. happen to really like ancient nerdy stuff. And yeah, um, yeah I, th I think the image of academics just sitting in an ivory tower and, and thinking thoughts is, you know, misses that, that dynamic of how like my questions don't exist in a vacuum. Right. And I can acknowledge that and embrace it and, and yeah. think about like, okay, I don't want my questions to overwhelm the text. And, yeah. and that's why 
the first book I wrote on violence was about how does the Bible itself think about violence as a problem? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I wanted that ground up question before I wrote this book on mm -hmm. how do Christians engage with violent texts? Because I think mm -hmm. sometimes there there is a sense in which, at, you know, as we engage our culture's questions in our own in that environment, we can almost smother the text so that it it's it doesn't. We don't have, allow it to have its own voice, yeah. so it's like yeah. a, a conversation, but we're just speaking at it rather than yeah. allowing it to speak back. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and for you know, as as someone who believes that that God speaks through Scripture, for Scripture to speak, it has to ha has to be a real other, it has to yeah. have its its own voice and ability to speak into my context, mess with my preconceptions, disrupt, have that kind of prophetic witness against. Yeah. the church. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's important. Yeah, no, that's really well said, really well said. And it, uh, it fits in so much with what I said in the, actually the very first episode and why I even called this podcast on the way is because I'm really mm -hmm. trying to locate us all in this journey together as we're yeah. making sense of reading scripture as embodied readers of the text. So I, I love it. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to begin by highlighting actually your last chapter of the book. So we're going to jump to the end and we'll come back through uh, through in a moment. But at the very end of the book, you open up the last chapter by saying, you know, I haven't set out to solve the problem of divine violence. It's not a problem we, re we can really solve um, in that way. And you use the term wicked problem to highlight the complex nature of certain problems that we deal mm -hmm. with, uh, that there's kind of like a tangled web of issues and yeah. you start pulling on one thread and then you cause other issues somewhere else. And so <laughs> you, you you're wanting to attend very carefully to that. And, um, and I, I, so I really appreciate the tenor of what you're doing there mm -hmm. and your willingness to embrace mystery to an extent, not a blind kind of mystery, but mm -hmm. a, a humble, well thought out, um, well reasoned uh, mystery. And so I just thought it'd be cool kind of to begin the book, our conversation on the book, kind of just talking about the spirit of the end of the book and how yeah. that ha actually shows your heart and what you're trying to do in the in the book as a whole. Yeah, thanks for highlighting that. There, there are a couple of converging issues there that are really important to me with regard to what I am trying to do in this book. And, and so by concluding that or beginning that concluding chapter with the statement that this is a an unresolvable problem. Um, it's it's not meant to be a kind of fatalistic statement, and nor is it supposed to sort of push us into, um, as you put it, like a blind trust in mystery. Like you know, hey, there are all these contradictory portraits of God in the Bible, and we just, we just have to sort of embrace it all and live with that tension, mm -hmm. right? Um, which is one approach to mystery that some people come to out of an effort to just make peace with the Bible we have. Mm -hmm. So I understand it, but I don't think that's where we have to remain mm -hmm. with regard to an unresolvable problem. So so as you mentioned, the idea of a wicked problem is a, is a problem for which there is no clear um, resolution. And there's ambiguity around the definition of the problem itself. And we certainly see that with violence in the Bible. Um, there's ambiguity around like paths forward for sure. Mm -hmm. And we don't even know when we've resolved it, right? Like how, how, how can I say that we've solved the problem of violence? Because you, you claim to solve it here and then another problem pops up over here. Or of course, like the subjective quality of saying, well, you know, let's say you say, um, we're all sinners and deserve death anyway. So we're just lucky that any of us are alive. So that solves the problem. Right. And I think, Max, you, you would probably say, well, no, it doesn't. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> I think right. it's different. Yeah, right? totally. Um, but you're, you're, you're right in saying that many, that, that is actually where many Christians land. And yeah. it, it causes a lot of problems for mm -hmm. the, the general witness of who, who the God is that we worship when we go. Yeah. yeah and in an analogy of a, of a wicked problem. So wicked doesn't mean a, a morally wicked problem. Right. Uh, but it it's a statement about the quality of the problem. So it's not like a complex math problem, like a calculus problem that has a solution, but it's probably really hard to work out, especially if you're math challenged. Um, a a wicked problem, by contrast, is is like poverty, mm. right? So poverty has uh, a convergence of issues impinging on it. So education, social context, 
um, you know, race, ethnicity, uh, opportunity. Like there's so many factors yeah. that contribute to poverty and make it enormously complex. And there's also no agreement on when you solved it. Is it when everyone has equal pay? Is it when everyone has the same standard of living or is it equal opportunity or, um, it, you know, that a roof over their head, like when, when, when is poverty solved? And we don't know, but because we can't, and also it's, it's not a problem that's going to be resolved aside of new creation. Mm -hmm. So because it can't be resolved, doesn't mean we throw up our hands and say, well, forget it then let's just live and let live and, and not worry about poverty. Right. That would be a, a stupid response, right? Right, right. So um, poverty is something we work at knowing that it won't be resolved. And and I think violence is similar. And and saying that it won't be resolved um, can open us up to seeing other uh, opportunities that emerge along the way. So it might be you might discover that you're not the only one with these questions, or you mm -hmm. might discover that the text is more wonderful than you previously thought. Right. Um, or you might discover that the texts that you thought were just uh, by definition and and entirely horrifically violent are actually beautiful hmm. and have a more nuanced take on that issue than you thought. So, yeah. so are there are other good outcomes yeah. that I hope to the book can help people walk yeah. through, walk toward. Yeah. And just to highlight that, I, I actually think that we have a lot of really challenging hermeneutical issues or interpretive issues that we, we deal with in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I really appreciate about what you just said it's very close to my heart as well is we've sometimes have given people the impression that the goal of biblical interpretation is to kind of shake the text till the right answer pops out, whatever that right yeah. answer is. And there's one yeah. right answer that everybody needs to come to. But in mm -hmm. fact, it may be that God has given us this complicated text for a variety of reasons, one of which mm -hmm. is actually in wrestling with the text together in community, mm -hmm. in trusting in the power of the spirit. God uses that process to form us yeah. into the image of Jesus. In, in other words, in the process of wrestling, we're learning to become more like uh, the one whom we 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 worship, and we're doing yeah. that together in community. I yeah, just I really that's like really that. Well put. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I'm going to quote it and and um, I'll footnote you. Awesome. Um, no, that's it. That's really. <laughs> I, I think that's that's great. And and a friend of mine uh, works in. Uh, he used to work with this organization that helped churches wrestle through issues that divide. Mm. Um, and one of the things that he said was that these issues that divide us are, are not just problems to be overcome, but they're actually opportunities for discipleship. And it's precisely along the lines of what yeah, you said. That's good. That, that in, in kind of grappling together, there is something formative that happens. And I think scripture itself recognizes that with, with the call to, you know, Joshua begins by, with the people about to cross the Jordan, standing on the land they're about to take and, or I should say receive because God's giving it to them. And, and he says like the thing you need to do, the thing you need to know most as you go into this land is that you need to meditate on Torah day and night. Hmm. And, and so that, that idea of meditating, you know, I think some of us might have an image of like closing your eyes and just sort of yeah, like, you know, having a word circulating in your head um, nonstop. Um, but the book then takes us right to the figure of Rahab. Mm. And so this the second chapter features a Torah related issue that needs to be considered. Wow. So you're you're walking out of Deuteronomy where it says, you know, show them no mercy, wipe them all out, kill them all. Then you encounter this Canaanite woman who's a prostitute and all your alarms are going off. But then it turns out she makes this extraordinary Yahweh confession. Mm. So I think meditating on Torah day and night is a real world dynamic and not just a sort of, um, I don't know, like wh whatever we think of as meditation. Yeah. Um, it is recitation, but it's also consideration with real world complexities. Yes. It don't yield to a simple solution. You can't just plunk down Torah on Rahab and say, okay, Deuteronomy 7 says you're to be wiped out. Okay, drive the sword through. Um, that's not what it means to meditate on Torah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Oh man. We could have a whole episode just on that, that point. Cause I think that's yeah. so, that's so important. Christians yeah. often flatten out the law. We imagine that, you know, there was some kind of mechanistic or wooden way that ancient yeah. Israelites were reading the law. But in fact, Torah is always about negotiating real life in yeah. light of the, the full revelation of the Torah. And that's, that's yeah. a complex reality, but we see it throughout scripture too. So Absolutely. yeah, I love it. That's such a cool example. Well, we'll have to come back to the, the, yeah. the Rahab piece in a moment here. Yeah. Um, one of the things you do at the beginning of the book is you, you kind of lay out for us some of the main ways that Christians mm -hmm. have handled violence in the old Testament. Um, what do you, what would you say are, are a few of maybe the, the predominant ways mm. that we, we've seen, we've seen this done. And just to preface this by saying a lot of the people that you discuss here are ancient Christians. In other mm. words, mm. this is important for us to hear as 21st century believers today, Christians and Jews have been wrestling with the problems of violence in the Bible for over two millennia. Um, and so that's important for us to appreciate. We're part of a, a larger interpretive community, uh, groups of communities that have been have been wrestling with this with this problem for quite some time. Yeah, th I think that is an important point. And, and you know, because sometimes it's framed as well, you, you know, as moderns, you have this issue with the Bible, but people didn't throughout history. It's like, yeah, you know, it's they, like they did in their own ways. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But uh, it, it, it has been something Christians and Jews have grappled with. Um, I mean, an example would be the the law in Deuteronomy. It says to stone a rebellious son. Um, in the the Talmud, the Jewish collection of of law and, and reflection on the law. I mean, basically they 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 interpret the heck out of that law such that they put so many conditions around it, making it virtually impossible that anyone would ever stone their son. Right? right. And so they're they're wrestling with that issue of the apparent injustice of that law mm -hmm. and making it impossible in the process. Right. right. And, and and they're, they're not crazy. just doing that um, randomly. Right. They're, mm -hmm. They see a problem there. Mm -hmm. So um, some of the approaches I've already mentioned, Marcionism, which is um, early church heretic who wanted to get rid of the law because of, um, you know, for him, it was had to do with like the creator God and problems with that, but also divine wrath and the mm -hmm. idea that God would have passions like that, especially negative passions, um, cause him to want to get rid of the Old Testament. And of course he did. And, and also in the process, cut out a lot of the New Testament. Right. And, and Marcin wasn't just this, this sort of, um, random guy from the first century, uh, who didn't have much impact. You know, he had quite a following. There were Marcionite churches all around that persisted for quite some time. So, and, and I think even into the present day, there are re Marcionite reflexes that continue in the church sure, uh, and beyond. So um, that's, a, that's a problematic approach to say the, the least. Um, I talk about why in the book, so I won't get into that too much. Yeah. But um, then there's also uh, what's known as divine command theory. Hmm. Uh, championed by Augustine, and and that is that if God commands something, it's by definition just, and so we we don't have the the authority or the capacity as humans to question God's commands, and because God's ways are higher than our ways, and so although we might not understand it, we have to yield to it, mm -hmm. and and there's also a desire there to protect. God from being held to some standard that's higher than himself. Mm -hmm. So there's no standard of justice that that kind of hangs over God and that God has to adhere to. Right. And and so this is a very influential and a compelling view that's that's had influence throughout church history. And and I and I think it's good to pause on the things that that view is trying to preserve. Mm -hmm. Um whether it be the the mystery of God's ways the fact that we can't fully comprehend and the fact that we need to yield ourselves to God's um, God's justice and so on. I think that's important, but <laughs> um, there are some issues with it as well. And I, I impact those in the book, but one of them just as an example is that we see throughout scripture that people do question God's justice. And that seems to be something God even invites. Right. When he calls, when he calls Abraham. He, he shows him what he's about to do to Sodom and Gomorrah, 
in order to evoke this negotiating response. And, and Abram says, will not the God of justice administer, is to administer justice, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there's, a, and there's a whole lament tradition and mm -hmm. there's a, a prophetic call to imitate God's justice. So you, if God's justice is so inscrutable and so beyond our ways that it has no correlation to anything we, we can recognize as justice, then I think the Bible has a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then there's, a a pretty rigorously Christocentric or even crucicentric approach, which is, I think the, the lead example of this is Greg Boyd, who, who argues in his book, The Crucifixion of the Warrior God, that because the cross is the clearest and fullest revelation of God, uh, which we could, we could actually dispute or at least nuance that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's go with that. Mm -hmm. um, then w that's, a, that's not only a statement about who God is, but it's also a lens through which we read the rest of the Bible. And so when we look at God commanding the Israelites to destroy the Canaanites or, or even just judging people in the Old Testament— um, or New Testament, right. then then we have to sort of turn the the lens and focus it until it looks like the cross, and and until it yields that image. And so what he says about these texts is that God is allowing Himself to be misrepresented, mm. and in and thereby allowing the sins of humanity to be heaped upon him, just like the sins of humanity were heaped on Jesus on the cross. Mm. Um, that's his. Yeah. Um, that, uh, that's one of his takes on, on that. And uh, I think the problem there, well, there's, there's a lot of problems. One is that that misrepresentation kind of strips the old Testament of its revelatory value, um, or at least any positive revel revelatory value. It's also the story that New Testament writers went back to to make sense of the cross because the cross doesn't make sense on its own. Mm -hmm. It needs some interpretive grid to or story within to situate it so that we can know what it means. Mm -hmm. like that Jesus was executed and came back from the dead is is very interesting on its own. It's <laughs> quite a phenomenon. Yeah, but it doesn't mean anything, right? Right, unless it's situated within some larger story or hermeneutical framework and for new testament writers that framework was the old testament mm. and and so you cut the legs out from under that meaning that he so values with regard to the cross so i think that's problematic as well i talk about like five other approaches too so yeah. it's just a sampling <laughs> yeah no that right there's a lot of different ones but that gives us a good yeah. uh uh i think a good uh intro to some of the mm -hmm primary ways. And and I think all of us have seen examples of that in one form yeah. or another too. So it's, it's really helpful. Um, so let's jump into the, the first half of the book is, is the flood, uh, mm -hmm. it's flood and fury. So yeah. flood and then conquest. Um, and before you really get into talking about flood, the, 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 the violence of the flood and everything, um, you begin with saying, um, actually, the creation narrative of Genesis is trying to establish a particular kind of story of wholeness, shalom, uh, mm -hmm. flourishing, and, and and so divine violence isn't baked into the story. It's a yeah. a sad consequence of human violence, which we'll we can talk about more in a moment. But maybe we say just a couple things about why the opening of Genesis is is so important to what, what you're yeah. what you're doing here in the project. Yeah, from a biblical point of view, Genesis 1 not only sets the tone in terms of telling us the beginning of the story, but it also represents the the end toward which God is moving creation. Mm -hmm. And so what was lost in Genesis 3 is, is um, I guess, the backdrop of Genesis 1 and 2, and it's God's redemptive work to reclaim that. So, so it's very important what is primordial because it tells us about the trajectory, the movement of God's redemptive work. Mm. And if violence was there in the beginning, then that means that God's redemptive end might include violence as well as just part of the ongoing way that the world will eventually be and the way that like redemptive activity 
the the way that it looks in the present too. Um, you know what those signs of new creation might entail. Mm -hmm. And so Genesis one is pretty radical when th when thinking about it against the backdrop, especially of the Babylonian creation story, uh, the Enuma Elish, that 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 seems to be in conversation, or that Genesis one seems to be in conversation with. Right. And in that creation story, you had God, the, the deity making the world out of the slain carcass of another deity and then making humanity out of the blood mixed with the ground of another um, lesser deity mm -hmm. and and so you had this sort of violent ontology or or um, statement about the nature of things it was woven into the dna of creation mm. in genesis 1 the the waters in the beginning of genesis 1 2 are are non-hostile mm. they're just there they're unformed but they're not a violent enemy that God has to sort of summon strength to subdue. And, and so it, they're simply a not yet condition. And so God out of the not yet and the unformed makes creation uh, into something. Hmm. And, and then even the sea monsters, which in other parts of the Bible represent hostile foes are called upon to be fruitful and multiply, right? Hmm. Let there be more sea monsters. They're mm -hmm. not enemies. They're not, they're God's, you know, play things, right? Right. And then um, humanity is called to rule and subdue, which in other contexts could connote violent subjugation, but they've got this vegetarian diet and they're called to rule and subdue as image bearers. So they're representing a God who wants this creation to flourish. Hmm. So in all these different ways, Genesis 1 is portraying and signaling to us that this is a, a sh world of shalom, of right-related wholeness, um, in which violence has no place. Yeah. So, so that's that's how the story is set up. Yeah. No, that's that's really helpful. And so, when you lay out then the story, the the violence that's introduced into the story, uh, this is one of the things I really appreciated about the way you introduce the flood stories. Is we often naturally go to this idea of okay it's it's divine violence and there is language mm -hmm. of god's judgment in the flood story but you ask us to say okay let's pause and put on the the thinking cap of the biblical writers here for a moment yeah. and what what's the framework that that they're actually mm -hmm. offering to us in this story and you say it, it quite clearly comes out that the framework is this is a story about human violence mm -hmm. and human destruction of god's uh god's good creation and uh, you trace the the motif of the these two verbs of seeing, mm -hmm. ra'a and lechak, taking or seizing, mm -hmm. uh, throughout that. That's kind of a story that gets played out from the garden into this world of ever evolving violence. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I just love to hear your thoughts about kind of how the flood story is framed up and the perspective that the the biblical writers mm -hmm. are trying to give us to think about this. Yeah, yeah. So Genesis in the lead up to the flood in, in Genesis seven wants us to see violence as a, as a major issue that comes out of human rebellion against God. And, and we see it already in the, the, the curse on the serpent mm -hmm. in Genesis three, where um, it says that um, I'm gonna, you know, God says, I'm going to put enmity between the woman's offspring, and the offspring of the serpent and enmity, which sounds just like animosity, is is actually a term that's used in the Old Testament for um, a, a kind of uh, premeditated violence, and and so we know, th and and of course the image there is violent of striking the heel and then the the woman's offspring striking the serpent. So there's this struggle that's going to happen, and and it's a deceitful violence. You know, striking the heel is a sneak attack, and of course in the next chapter, then you have. Cain rising up against his brother in the field and striking him down. And, and so violence is the, the lead story then in mm. chapter four as the case in point of this struggle. Um, and, and you're right. There's also the, the, the theme of humanity. So for instance, in the garden, seeing that the fruit is pleasing and taking uh, whatever taking for themselves. Um, and then, and this is a kind of pattern, seeing, pleasing, taking that mm -hmm. plays out then in Genesis six, where the sons of God, whoever they are, right? Divine beings, 
see the daughters of humanity that they're pleasing and taking for themselves. This is not a positive statement about, right. you know, the gods marrying human women and, and, um, you know, living happily ever after. So they, they seize these women, um, you know, it's a forceful image, uh, arguably rape mm -hmm. and out of them, uh, they give birth, they, they give birth then to the, the great warriors of old, mm -hmm. great in quotes. Um, and so the, the emergence of this warrior class that goes on in the figure of Nimrod in chapter 10 to found the great cities like Babylon and Nineveh and so on. Um, so they're associated with these urban contexts, uh, the emergence of a warrior class as the byproduct of humans taking what they want. So in both cases, in Genesis 3 and in Genesis 6, that the effect of seeing pleasing uh, what, what's pleasing and taking it is violence. Mm. And, and by Genesis 6, then, it says that that violence had filled the earth. Mm. And that's not just a statement about moral depravity. From, from Genesis' point of view, that's an ecological statement. Um, that violence between humans and even from animals ruins creation. And so there's a statement in Genesis 6 where God looks at the earth and behold, it was ruined. Mm. The Hebrew term is shachat, to, mm. to be ruined. And that's an inversion of Genesis 131 where it says God looked at the earth and behold, it was very good. So creation has been upended from its good state to now this ruined state. And, and so then that leads into the flood story that, that follows then. Yeah, so that's really helpful. So the flood story, as the biblical writers are presenting it to us, is not kind of some arbitrary act, but it is kind of a, a, a last-ditch effort or almost like a the, – the, it's – the thing has already been ruined. The, God's mm -hmm. looking and grieving that his yeah. good creation has been ruined. It's not that it, they're ruining it. It has been. And so then at that point, the choice is it's, it, it's you know, we kind of have to start over in some way. Yeah. Right. And and so how are we going to yeah. do that? Yeah, yeah. Very, very much so. So so that divine emotion, the only emotion that God has in the story is grief, mm. it's pain, literally pain to his heart. There's no reference to divine wrath. Now, there is a statement that God says, he looked at the earth, behold, it was ruined, and therefore I will ruin the earth. So you mm -hmm. do have to deal with, well, what do you do with that statement? Yeah. And the, and the way I talk about it in the book is that it's analogous to a potter who is spinning clay on the, on a wheel. Have you ever spun clay before? I haven't, but I've watched okay. it. I've even watched a sermon where the entire time the guy was spinning it on the wheel as he was oh, preaching. Wow. That okay. Was, that, yeah. that was, that was the thing they did back in uh, the, the nineties. So, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a classic sermon illustration and, and um, of course it shows up in the Bible. Right. Um, so imagine spinning the, this pot and you look down and it's full of air bubbles and like pieces are flapping all over and there are holes in it. If you want to make that you know, bowl or whatever it is you're making, you have to return it to useful formlessness mm -hmm. in order to remake it. That's the precondition. So you can't just sort of patch it up because it will explode in the kiln. Right. So I think it's similar. Like that act of destruction on God's part is the returning of creation back to useful formlessness so that he can remake it. Mm -hmm. And and it's important to note that I think, you know, my take on the Genesis six to nine or six to eight segment is that this is engaging with popular flood stories. This is not yeah. a, a one for one historical event. Mm -hmm. probably rooted in local flooding events in Mesopotamia, but not mm -hmm. um, straightforwardly historical. Um, but it's retelling those known cultural flood story stories within a monotheistic framework. Okay. And so, whereas typically you would have the protagonist God and the antagonist, the antagonist God sends the flood, the protagonist tells the hero to build a boat and preserve his family and animals, which happens in several other flood stories. Um, in Genesis, it says that the antagonist is violence. Mm. 
God is still, Yahweh is still the protagonist, but the antagonist is violence. That's the thing that ruins the earth. And so God then does this um, act of, he, um, he, he saves humanity in a, in a microcosm of creation mm -hmm. in the ark. Yeah. Um, so I think that's how the story wants us to read it as God's life-saving endeavor. And I talk in the book about, you know, kids depictions in like kids Bibles and flannel graphs of, of the flood where you have like Noah and his family happy in the ark. And I sort of joke about it at first, right? Um, like, cause it misses all the violence. Right. But I do think in the end, that is the image the story wants us to walk away with. Yeah. About like who God is. God is the God who preserves creation mm. is, and is uh, you doggedly committed to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's really helpful. Um, okay, so uh, it's obvious to to you and and to me because we spent some time in biblical studies and and you even more so of obviously with me in the in the Old Testament. Um, we're we're familiar with the ancient Near Eastern culture a little bit, mm -hmm. and we're familiar with the the source critical treatment of the Old Testament. So the idea mm -hmm. that you know actually the flood story is probably a combination of flood traditions that have been brought mm -hmm. together in the Bible, and um, and it seems pretty obvious to us that Genesis is responding to these traditions to make the kind of theological points mm -hmm. that you'd make. What would be a couple of things you might say to uh, people who haven't really thought through that much and maybe yeah. even be a little bit um, alarmed to hear that, oh, mm. this isn't just kind of like straightforward historical reporting? Yeah. Yeah. A couple of things I'd say. One, one is... Um what I'm saying about the flood story is a genre designate statement. Like when we read poetry, we have different expectations of its accuracy than when we're reading uh, a science report. Right. right? Um, so we, we allow poetry to say certain things that are not literally true, but are true in some other sense. Mm -hmm. Um, and and so and we allow this when it comes to literature. So when Jesus says a man went down to Jericho and tells the story of the Good Samaritan, the truth of that story doesn't hang on that story actually having happened. Um, we allow for this non-literal, non-historically literal um, story to say something true about what God calls us to in the world, who God is, etc. And and so, same with the flood story. So I'm I'm making a genre designation, and mm -hmm. and I'm happy for people to dispute that and see it differently. But but my own perspective is that this is engaging uh, a popular a story or parable um, from the ancient world, a founding story. Some people mm -hmm. call them myths, but I you know that can be pretty loaded, right? Um, and recasting it to say something true about the character of God and about the nature of the world. Yeah. And, and so that's important. Um, I would also say to try to avoid a sort of domino effect or house of cards approach to the question where you think that, well, if that's not historically literal, then what about the resurrection? Right. right? Um, because I think that's where people often go mentally. Like if I can't trust that, then yeah. what, what can I, I trust? I think there's a big there's a big arc replica somewhere in the middle of the country, yeah. maybe that's kind of predicated on this whole thing, right? It, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just, you know, if if they just saw genre differently, I think the whole need for that would would go away. But you know, um, uh, many jobs would be lost. So we don't right. want that. It, it, it does create jobs, I suppose. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so, yeah, I, th I think avoid that house of cards, domino effect where we're like, you know, this doesn't take out the resurrection. The re resurrection is a different kind of historical claim. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 so I, I don't feel like it threatens that. Um, and then also, like, I've used an art analogy before of, like, thinking of genres as artistic, like different artistic um, styles. And so... Mm -hmm. If you look at a, a realism painting, there there are texts in the Old Testament that are closer to realism, mm. like the Samuel narratives or something like that. Um, and then there are stories that are more impressionistic. Mm -hmm. And impressionism is not like if you think of Monet's Water Lilies. It's it's not like 
you look at those and say, ah, too bad I don't have a photograph of those lilies because right. that would be clearer. It would be more realistic. It would be more accurate. Um, no, you look at those and say, wow, what uh, – Monet is capturing something about the experience of encountering and moving out into nature um, that you can't capture with a photograph. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so – using a different artistic genre like you could say myth myth recasting <laughs> in right. genesis six to eight says something that couldn't be said otherwise yeah. and and so it's a movement toward truth to recognize that genre and then try to understand it on its own terms yeah yeah that's really helpful that's really helpful i've used the same art analogy not monet's water lilies but mm -hmm. the similar kind of thing when talking about the fourfold gospel as well yeah. you know yeah. we, we've got four gospel stories sitting alongside mm -hmm. one another and it doesn't take much effort if you compare them closely to see similarities yeah. and differences and yeah. recognize what's going on there so yeah yeah that's really mm -hmm. helpful um all right, let's let's uh, transition if we can to the the fury piece, um, mm -hmm. which may I think in some ways be I don't know be harder for some people, mm -hmm. uh, especially when we think about like the history of how the, these texts have been used to justify mm -hmm. conquest and violence, um, it, even in our own United States, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and with with colonialism, like it's mm -hmm. a a really dark history in some ways of how these yeah. these texts have been used. Although they've been used in a variety of other ways as well, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned the book, like the spiritualizing interpretation, so mm -hmm. that the enemies are actually like your your uh, passions, the things you need yeah. to overcome, and and that's yeah. typically, honestly, even though we don't do a lot of allegory in protestant christianity if you go mm -hmm. to a protestant church that's probably how it's going to be preached right i mean yeah. i've heard this yeah. preached several times all the ites in your life whatever they yeah. are yeah. right you know get you know yeah. and 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 in some ways it's trying to make it useful spiritually mm -hmm. useful but there's some so, some tough stuff we have to to think through um probably the trickiest isn't just that Israel goes to war because I mean, all ancient peoples went mm -hmm. to war or Israel has a God and believe their God was in charge because all, mm -hmm. but, but the, the, when God commands Israel yeah. to annihilate, right. So the, the band, yeah. the harem. Um, so could you just talk a little bit about how you handle that particular mm -hmm. issue in the book? Yeah. So the command to wipe out the Canaanites, show them no mercy and leave alive. Nothing that breathes is first uttered in Deuteronomy um, in terms of its sort of reference to the Canaanite peoples. Um, and and it's important to recognize Deuteronomy's own genre and style of speaking. Right. Right. So Deuteronomy is, is kind of taking the law from Exodus and parts of Numbers and preaching it mm -hmm. almost from a fiery – yeah, you know, it's it's sort of fiery sermon at points, mm -hmm. um, and so the rhetoric is heightened. Mm. So that command there, Deuteronomy seven, is a, is a kind of heightening of earlier commands rhetorically to make a point, and I think that's important to keep in mind. It's kind of like you know when Jesus says, "If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out." Mm. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut them off. Yeah. Oh, that's um, really helpful. That's a helpful and, yeah comparison. And so you you hear it and you're meant to feel the force of it. You're not meant to just say immediately, oh, you don't mean that literally. Okay, fine. <laughs> right? Like you're to take it seriously and and let it sink in. And so when Moses in Deuteronomy is saying that to the people, they're to take it seriously. But I don't think it's meant to be taken strictly literally. Mm -hmm. And the story itself seems to suggest this. Mm -hmm. uh, especially how later interpreters of that command at the end of Joshua and throughout the book of Kings and Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah reinterpret reinter that, mm -hmm. that verse. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the earlier command in Exodus said that they're to displace the peoples and, and specifically that God was going to displace the Canaanites little mm -hmm. by little, it says. Mm. Um and lest the wild animal should increase in the land. So that the original command was to tear down their altars and avoid their idols and not intermarry with them 
And that seems to be the enduring sense in which Israel interpreted that law. Yeah. Now, there are some references in Joshua to the people leaving alive nothing that breathes. So we do have to deal with those right. uh, seemingly literal applications. Um, but there, again, I think we have to think about the genre in which it's written, where that kind of heightened rhetoric was part of the sort of Deuteronomic tradition of saying that they wanted decisive victory and um and of course we even in some of the passages where it says they left nothing alive that breathes there are plenty of canaanites left in those areas that yeah. breathe right right the so it'd be like wanted... it'd be like yeah it'd be like saying like when you say we left nothing alive it'd be almost like saying today in a sports analogy like we really whooped their butt or something yeah. like that yeah it's that kind of a, a trope right yeah it is um yeah. and and so uh, you know there are some complexities there that need to be dealt with so like, I don't want to just say, oh, if you just, it's just trash talking, but it, there's a definitely a component of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think those are just a couple of things. And I, I talk about more in the book um, about how to wrestle with the mm -hmm. harem laws. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're challenging, but I, but I do think that, that Joshua is, is not trying to um, have us come away from from those stories thinking that uh, that a literal application of harem is the main or only thing that's required of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's also important to remember that the book was written for or to in its final form, a people who are probably living during the exile or even later. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not really a contentious view. I mean, I mean, there are some people that would balk at that. So it's important to bear in mind but joshua is part of this this whole story that runs from joshua through the end of kings mm -hmm. and if it is like written with that end in mind mm -hmm. which it seems to be then the earliest date for its final form is the exile mm -hmm. um, and and that's a time when you the possibility of ousting canaanites is no longer possible right uh, or when they come back into the land, it's no longer possible. Well, but, if, you, if you ask Matthew, the evangelist, he he thinks there's still Canaanites. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's a good example. This, woman. Right. She's yeah. a Canaanite because he's trying yeah. to amp up that same thing. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, but it doesn't mean that those laws are irrelevant. So the question is, how do we abide by the harem laws mm -hmm. when there are no Canaanites around? And I think the answer is to root out any hint of idolatry among the people. Yeah. Um, and to uh, avoid the kind of intermarriage that would lead to idolatry. Yeah. So that's that's how it's meant to be lived out. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I think that's really helpful. I mean, we might still struggle with probably should still struggle with is preserving stories about wanting to wipe people out a good spiritual practice or like yeah. wrestling with that aspect. of yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. But we do want to recognize, right. The very likely rhetorical function of these stories isn't yeah. to actually lead people to go out and take up arms, but to make them, you know, ultra committed to, yeah. to Yahweh and yeah. no other and no other God. So the destruction yeah. piece really gets applied to idolatry. That's what yeah. is being called to be destroyed. Yeah. And, you know, Jesus commands his disciples, you know, if you want to be my disciple, you have to hate your father, mother, brother, sister. Right. And which you could render as forsake. And there are plenty of people that follow Jesus as disciples loyally and ha are on good terms with their parents or siblings. Right. right? right. Um, and, but, but the point of that is to consider the cost of discipleship and, and consider the total loyalty that discipleship requires. It's not a, it's not a sort of split loyalties endeavor. Mm -hmm. And some people literally do leave their families to follow Jesus. There's that like literal costliness, hopefully not combined with actual hate, right? Right. But but the the rhetoric is is important. Right. And I think in the same way, I don't want to so like soften the blow of the harem text that we don't feel their force as well. And I think mm. that's that's key. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you even talk about in the book, the first thing they do when they cross, right, is they take out the the knife, not to do battle against the the enemy of flesh and blood, but to circumcise themselves, right? Which yeah. 
already kind of tells us like what the heck were their parents doing in the wilderness like did they yeah. not they didn't get the memo and right um you know but it's like it's like this is the first thing we need to do because actually the battle really to use a Pauline term, what I hear you saying in the book clearly is the battle actually isn't against flesh and blood. Yeah. And that's not a spiritualizing interpretation of the text. Mm -hmm. That is actually the rhetorical aim yeah. of, of the text. Yeah, the very Testament well put. Text. Yeah, exactly. Um, the Because the strategies they employ in the first six chapters, like the, the whole book is setting you up one thing after another of like what it is that's going to lead the people – to become victorious and successful. And it's, it's like I said, meditating on Torah. It's, it's taking on the sign of the covenant through circumcision. It's the celebration of Passover. Mm -hmm. It's this two chapter long, almost over the top meditation on the ark as it processes across the Jordan and the people behold it in a worshipful mm -hmm. posture. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, one thing after a, another, the the book is guiding us into the things that will uh, give the people standing and success and victory, and none of them are military. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. And in fact, like you said, with circumcision, it's, it's almost like a self wounding. That, right. Yeah. That it's not the best way to put your. Yeah. It's not the no. best way to prepare for battle. Let's just say. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend it. It's, yeah. Uh, it's a. You know. The, <laughs> In Genesis 34, right there's there's the case of the Shechemites who the right. uh, Simeon and Levi trick into circumcising them and all the men in the town. And there's that classic line of like, what well, while they were still sore, right, right. <laughs> they go in and slaughter the town. Right, it's, right, it's a deliberate right. weakening, and they knew that. Right, right. Can we talk a little bit about on this piece of the enemies? You you draw out in the book really helpfully. The people that the armies are fighting, Joshua seems very focused on these sort of divine kings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know we're avoiding the term myth, but I don't mind it. Uh, there is yeah. a little bit of a mythological yeah. connection with these kings mm -hmm. that's present in ancient Near Eastern culture. Kings are divine or semi-divine. Mm -hmm. But we also have this thing that the, the authors are doing where they're connecting these kings to the descendants of the the Nephilim. So these giants yeah. that came from that that big Genesis 6 thing, which Genesis doesn't make a big deal about, but a yeah. lot of other Jewish literature does. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and so we have this kind of like, um, it's like a polemic against, you're not divine king, you're, you're this, uh, you know, um, uh, problematic progeny from this yeah. uh, illicit relationship, right? That's what we're saying about these. And so these are the, the kings that we're fighting. So you've got that piece, and then you've mm -hmm. got the other piece that is, these kings are politically tied in with Egypt, the enslaving yeah, yeah. power that Israel was just released from. And that's something that a lot of us yeah. don't realize as well, that this, yeah. at the period where they're coming in ostensibly, right. right? Like these are military outposts in some ways yeah. for, yeah. for, for Egypt. So I wonder if you just talk yeah. us through that a little bit. Sure. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of pieces there. Um, so Genesis six, you have the sons of God, coming to the daughters of humanity, having these offspring. And it says in Genesis 6, now the Nephilim were on the earth in those days as well. And, and so we're supposed to have a mental association between the offspring of these fallen deities and the Nephilim, which literally means fallen ones. Mm. Um, nephal in Hebrew means to yeah. fall. Um, easy verb to remember. Yeah, And, and so <laughs> in, now there's this like, really interesting genealogical connection that you have to piece together but like basically the anakim who show up in the land of canaan are descendants of the nephilim and and we might have in our mind because the bible interprets them this way sometimes just giants right big people so who so they're probably pretty strong too but in the ancient world um these aren't just big people they're semi-divine, usually royal figures. And and Joshua features them at points um, as a summary, of, especially of the northern campaign in, in Joshua 11, to um, actually the hill country campaign, um, to talk about the, the occupants of some of these walled cities that Israel encountered. Mm -hmm. And so the... So we're to imagine them going into the land, confronting these semi-divine kings who are occupying these big walled late bronze 
probably uh, late bronze cities that probably still had some middle bronze giant walls around them. Mm -hmm. And, and those are the forces that Israel is attacking. And as you mentioned, they're also historically during this time period, these cities were backed by funded by and armed by Egypt. Mm -hmm. Egypt still is uh, wanting control of the land of Canaan. And it's exercising that control through these city-state kings. Mm -hmm. um, they're losing their grip at this time, but they're still there. Mm -hmm. And so if we think of the battles in those terms, and that's where Joshua leads us often. In fact, in Joshua 12, it summarizes the battles and it just talks about all the kings that they destroyed. Um, so Israel's campaigns are not against the little outlying villages and people, you know, dwelling in tents on the hillsides. They go for the walled cities where there are these powerful kings backed by Egypt who are, according to the story, semi-divine um, spiritual forces. Mm -hmm. So I, I think at that level, there is a sense in which this battle is not just against fle flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers of darkness mm -hmm. that are controlling this land. And, and in many ways, the story of the conquest can be thought of as a kind of Exodus part two. Yeah. Like in order to occupy this land, they're going to need to break the power of Egypt over it, which is exercised through those local kings. Mm -hmm. um, so again, this is a, the, the dynamic of the Anakim and, and their uh, giant counterparts um, is not the primary plot in Joshua, but is it is a kind of interesting subplot that shows up here and other places in the Old Testament, and I think needs to be attended to, and I think it's important. Yeah, and hearing this idea, right, that the the entrance into the land is like a kind of Exodus part two is a really helpful connection for people to have in their yeah. mind. Because it's not like the text announces that to us, but no, it doesn't. From, from the historical context, yeah. right? This allows this, this connection yeah. to be made, which is. And really there were, I mean, even after Israel settles in the land, there are several uh, Egyptian campaigns through the land. And in fact, one of them is preserved in the Merneptah stele, right. which is the earliest external reference to Israel. But we often don't think through it. The fact that a Pharaoh campaign in the um, uh, it was the 11th century, 12th century, and um, and, Isn't talks the, about, and the announcement is something like Israel is no more, right? Yeah, or something yeah. Like Israel's that. seed is laid waste; it is no more. Right, and, which is another so, example of this yeah, kind of, of we we wiped them out completely. Right, exactly. Right, There's right, the over the top rhetoric right, there, and of right. course they did survive it, but um, but it shows us that. Egypt is still trying to deal with the problem of Canaan. They wanted to control it because it's a buffer between them and the Hittites to the north and any other invading armies. And they also wanted to extract the, you know, the the goods from the land because it was a good source of olive oil and and wine. Mm. So um they had an interest in it mm -hmm. uh, that was not in the interest of the people there. Mm. And uh, whether it be the Israelites who are settling in the land at that point or some of the Canaanites as well. And I think for that reason, some of the Canaanites joined Israel. Yeah. Well, and, and that's also helpful uh, coming back to our point about context shaping mm -hmm. the way we read. You know, I, I suspect that if you ask people who are reading from a context where they live in a place that's been occupied or formally occupied yeah. or been in a situation of, of, of dark oppression, yeah. that uh, they might resonate with the story of Joshua in a different way than, right. let's say, an academic sitting in his office wondering about the problem of evil and suffering yeah. and all this kind of thing. So yeah, um, there's that facet of it too, right? Yeah. Like once we contextualize it in that way, um, it opens up different angles. It doesn't solve it, but it opens up different angles for thinking about that story. Yeah. I mean, it, Canaan, that land was continuously occupied, almost continuously, right? There are these little blips where they gain a kind of autonomy. And those are the exceptions, like mm -hmm. Maccabean period, as you know. Right, and, right. Um, it, it, the, the period of the emergence of the um, uh, kingdoms of David and Solomon, mm -hmm. so like a brief reprieve mm -hmm. uh, from the otherwise normal situation of occupation. Mm -hmm. So so the the idea of the idea of Israel just going in and um, attacking indigenous peoples is not quite the picture. Mm. Um, and I think that's where you know, like 
maybe for good reason, we go when we think about this story. And and of course, it was used that way in the um, in some of the battles against uh, Native Americans uh, in the colonial period. Mm -hmm. And and so, but that's that's not quite. I think the accurate the the right picture we should have when thinking about the the politics of Canaan at that time. Yeah, no, that's great. It's like our situation and context might heighten our awareness to certain problems in the text in yeah. healthy ways, right? Yeah. But we also have to say, what is the text actually saying? Mm -hmm. And is some of the ways that it's been used, can we demonstrate interpretively that that's a that's actually a clear misuse of the text? Yeah. Or 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 at the very least, it's a an interpretation you can arrive at, but it's it's by far not the best one, right? Yeah. Uh, and and one thing that I I kind of came to as I was studying Joshua that um, I hadn't really thought before was that, so you have the Deuteronomic command to, um, which I think the point of is to avoid idolatry and intermarriage. Um, when Joshua is portraying the Canaanites, it doesn't really portray them in terms of idolatry, which is interesting. You'd think that's where it would go. Mm. Um, it mentions it in passing at the end of the book, mm -hmm. but the portrait of them, is in terms of militarism, these powerful kings, walled cities, and weapons of power. Mm -hmm. And I think what Joshua does is it takes the concept of idolatry and applies it to the kind of imperial-backed system that Canaanite that Canaan represents. Mm. That Israel is to avoid and shun as it's establishing its own kingdom in the land. Mm. Right. And um and so, so very, very similar almost then to what we have at the end of the canon with what Revelation does with, yeah, with Rome. exactly. Yeah, 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 very much so. Um, you know, not, not exclusively the problem of worshiping idols, literal idols, right. um, but a, a kind of idolatry that's represented in this imperial backed Canaanite system. Mm. So, so I think that's one of the interesting moves that Joshua makes. Yeah. It's also concerned with idolatry at the end because Israel, ironically, is told to put away the idols that are among them. Right. <laughs> oh, interesting. You know, kind and of Joshua doesn't. Into, yeah. yeah and Joshua is. doesn't tell the you know the Levites to go through and slaughter every Israelite with an idol. He just says, "Put away the, the idols." Like, right. Here we are. We're like, get rid of them. Come on. <laughs> right. 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 Oh wow. That's yeah. That's a really interesting point. Yeah. Well, that, I think this is all really, uh, really, really helpful. I think there's probably a million things running through uh, my audience's mind right now. I know there, there, there's sure. a million things running through my mind too as we talk talk through this. Maybe if you were going to kind of leave people with just a couple big takeaways to keep mm -hmm. in mind when they're wrestling through this very complex, difficult problem of uh, violence in the Bible. Um, I mean, we kind of talked about a little bit already at the beginning, but yeah. Do you have any sort of final thoughts or, or, or words of wisdom? Um, I'm thinking of the part of the book where you say you don't have to burn your house down and yeah. <laughs> kind, of, kind of thing. Like um, yeah. when I think the book kind of models this humble, uh, diligent engagement with scripture, willing to ask difficult questions, but also realize like we don't have to have hundred percent certainty on everything either to, to move forward yeah. with God. Right. So yeah. yeah, just be curious to hear what are what are some of your your thoughts as you kind of sit back and reflect yeah. and maybe even think like pastorally what you say to students, what you say mm -hmm. to people in church. Yeah, I think part of what I want people to do is is to to avoid two extremes, one of which is total resignation to the problem, just saying like this this problem of violence is just you know, we can't do anything about it. It's it's overwhelming and maybe I just need to just trust in its vague sense, right? Yeah. Um, total resignation. But I also want people to avoid total resolution um, or at least count the cost of total resolution. If if a solution looks too good to be true, where it makes the problem just disappear entirely, there might be hidden consequences to that. So read the fine print uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, on any proposal that just gets rid of the problem. Yeah, um, that's good. I'd also, I'd also say that it's important to pan out as well um, and and to recognize where the Bible itself puts our, you know, directs our center of focus mm. when it comes to God's character. Because ultimately, this question about violence is a question about God's character and whether God is good. 
Um, and, and the Bible has a kind of prioritizing that it does for us that we can embrace. And that is when it, when it thinks about God's character, it summarize, there's a summary statement in Exodus 34. It says yeah. the Lord, the Lord of God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faith, faithfulness and so on. And it doesn't leave the guilty unpunished, punish, punishes the third and fourth generation. But that statement itself talks about his steadfast love to thousands of generations and his judgment to the third and fourth generation. And I think the math isn't the point, but I think it is showing a disproportion mm -hmm. in God's character. Mm -hmm. And that statement about God's character reverberates throughout scripture. Mm -hmm. So it's clear that the Old Testament itself sees that statement as definitive when it comes or centering, I should say, when yeah. it comes to understanding the heart of God. Yeah. And so it's kind of like with the uh, Apostles' Creed, and I talk about this in the book, where that's a good distillation of core Christian convictions. And it's a way of reminding us of like our basic beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and in the in the Apostles' Creed, there's no statement about whether there's one or two Gadarene demoniacs. Right. Right. Like that's not the center of our faith. Yeah. Like, the answer to that question. Um, I believe that there were two demoniacs, you know, right. and that the one is just unaccounted for and the other account in the gospel, right? Right. The, well, the, and they the, disagree, they disagree on the name of the region too. There's two yeah. neighboring Gareso is a little too far for Matthew, so he just moves yeah. it over a little bit closer to the yeah. sea. Well, you see, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. And but like that's not at the center of our faith. Right. And we can quibble over that and 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 leave it hang in suspension, right? Um, so there are greater matters of the law and lesser matters of the law. Mm -hmm. When the Psalms sing about God's character, they don't come back to you are a God of harem. Mm -hmm. Um, you are you are wrathful. Um, and yes, they mention it, but they don't. There's no Psalm 136 equivalent where Psalm 136 says over and over God, again, um, the the loyalty of Yahweh endures forever. Mm. The chesed of Yahweh endures forever. Yeah, That's the drumbeat of Israel's history. And so, so scripture, like, so if you pan out, there's a sense in which at the end of the day, what is God like? His, his character is merciful. Yes. You need to hold that intention with God's judgment, but these are not even two equals. Mm. So, so I would say just, I mean, just like Jesus says, the heart of the law, love God, love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. Not saying nothing else matters. Right. That's the heart of it. That's the heart of the, it. Yeah. The heart of God's character in the Old Testament is, is uh, in a similar sense, God's mercy. So, so I would say when it comes to violence, re just remember what's at the center and what's not at the center. That's not to say we shouldn't wrestle with those things, and I that's why I wrote a book about it. Right. But it's not at the center, mm -hmm. and I don't think Scripture even directs us that way. Yeah, that's super helpful. Like we we often make that mistake of taking things that aren't at the center, mm -hmm. putting them there and making everything about that and yeah. yeah. We just we just miss we we miss it, right? And we also I think we really have to wrestle with in American Christianity, we've consistently given the message to ourselves in the church and to those who aren't in the church that God, God's hatred for you because of your sin yeah. is yeah. a problem God has to somehow overcome before he can love you. Yeah. And that just does not in any yeah. way uh, reconcile, like, like fit with the character of no. God we see portrayed in either of the Testaments. Um, exactly. So, yeah, I appreciate you. You brought that out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, uh, Matt, for the conversation. It's really a delight to catch up with you and um, to talk about your excellent book. Um, I, I've really appreciated it. And I'll be recommending this to students and uh, and really everybody for years to come, because, as I said, this is a problem that I've just really wrestled with my entire life of faith. And this is this book has been really helpful for me on a personal level working through mm. some of these questions. So yeah. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Glad to hear it, Max. Thanks. Thanks so much for the conversation. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please make sure you subscribe using the link below and check out some more of our videos.